go. Good, how are we doing? Wonderful. Right, I'm going to get stuck straight in. Sorry, just getting a little bit of feedback. Do you mind pulling this down a tiny bit? Um, we are continuing our series. We're going straight into it. Encounters with Jesus. I've been loving this series. I've been loving seeing how when people from all walks of life encounter Jesus, they discover he meets them at their place of need. He meets us today at our place of of need. He knows what's in our hearts. He knows what's in our lives. He knows what we need. And again, as we've been encouraged through our time of worship, he is the source. He is the source. He is the source of living water. He is the source of life itself. And time and time again, we see people's lives transformed as they simply encounter Jesus. This morning, we're going to look at what happened when Jesus encountered a woman who was dragged in front of him, accused of committing adultery. But before we get into that passage, I wonder what your first memory was of feeling really guilty for something that you did. I was thinking about this, and the first thing that popped into my mind was I was about six years old, thereabouts, and um, I don't know if I've shared this before. I've got a, memory, a feeling I have, but it's obviously ingrained in my memory. But uh, I was teaching my best friend how to throw. And for some unknown reason, I thought at the time the best way to throw was to hold the object in your hand and spin round as fast as you possibly can. And when you reached maximum velocity, you released the object in your hand, thereby propelling it as far as you can. Um, it kind of worked, but unfortunately the object was a stone, and I was teaching my friend in the front garden, in our front garden, right in front of this massive picture window. It was basically the whole front of our house was this one big window, and you can imagine what happened next, but behind that very large picture window, my mum was leading a very serious prayer meeting with some of the ladies in the church. And, uh, I mean, perhaps they were praying for breakthrough. I don't know. But they were not expecting that kind of breakthrough. Because literally, days before safety glass, shards of glass covered every single one of them in that front room. Everyone was literally just in a state of shock. Kind of shame to say, my first response was to run for it. Um, my friend was holding a stone. Maybe he would get the blame. Um, but my conscience got the better of me. And I sheepishly walked into the sitting room <laughs> with all these ladies just standing there covered in glass, and I apologized. Now, my mum's reaction might have been a bit different had she not been surrounded by people from the church. But what she said to me was very simple. She said, Stephen, she only uses Stephen when I'm in trouble. Stephen, that was silly, wasn't it? Don't do it again. And she got on her hands and knees, dustpan and brush, and started sweeping up the glass. And we all got stuck in to do that. So not only is that my first memory of feeling properly guilty, it's actually also my first memory of receiving grace. Because that window was expensive, really expensive. And I knew my parents did not have much money. But do you know what? They never mentioned it again. Never mentioned it again. And do you know what? I never threw stones in that front garden again. Because the thing is, when you receive grace, it has a tendency to change you on the inside. And when we talk about grace, we're talking about not getting what we deserve. In fact, it's more than that. It's getting what we really don't deserve. Favor, forgiveness, love. And this is the very message of grace, grace that leads to inner change that Jesus 
came to proclaim, and it flew in the face of all the religious leaders of his day who were all about doing this and doing that and attaining this kind of external holy status by, by doing good works and doing things, earning this respect, earning this sense of holiness. And as we've seen throughout this series, Encountering Jesus, actually the Pharisees and religious leaders of the day were, were therefore deeply suspicious of Jesus, to put it mildly. He appeared to contradict the law of Moses. He didn't. What was the issue was their understanding of the law was askew. It wasn't Jesus' interpretation of it. He never did contradict the law of Moses. But anyway, they were looking for ways to silence him, to trap him, either to expose him as a fraud or to get him in so much trouble they could have him arrested and ultimately killed. A day before this encounter that we're going to look at this morning, Jesus had stood up in the temple courts on the last day of the Festival of Tabernacles and he declared... John 7, 37, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And do you know what? Many believed. Like that woman at the well, the Samaritan at the well. I want this living water. Their eyes were opened. You are the source of life. Many did believe and followed him, but many others didn't. And more than that, they heard those words and were like, sounds like blasphemy. He's, he's, a, he's a heretic. He needs silencing. We need to do something about this. This guy needs to be shut down. And so it's within this sort of context that Jesus now encounters this woman. Let's read John chapter 8 from verse 1 to, uh, to verse 11. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts. This is the next day after he had stood up and declared that he was the source of living water. The teachers of the law, often called the scribes, and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Right in the middle of Jesus' flow, teaching anyone who would listen in the temple courts, these religious leaders drag in this, this, this poor woman, feeling publicly humiliated and shamed just just like bait in a trap that they were setting for Jesus and it was a seriously clever trap it was a seriously clever pl ploy because if Jesus said no let her go you barbaric he'd be labeled a heretic anyway well hold on you're contradicting you're definitely contradicting the law of Moses then and yet if he'd said fair's fair the law's the law stone her what would that do to his own teaching on forgiveness? What would that do to his, his reputation as a friend of sinners? It's like, what? On top of that, remember that they were all under Roman occupation. And at the time, the death sentence could only, only be authorized by a Roman official. 
That's why Pontius Pilate was dragged into Jesus' trial. And so, you know, I mean, you could just imagine that the scribes' joy. This is delicious. We've got him. We've absolutely got him. If he says no, he'll be condoning sin, contradicting the law of Moses. He's dead. If he says yes, he's going against all his followers, against his people, against his own teaching, and against Rome. He's dead. Win-win for them. It's a brilliant trap. And the thing is, the scribes, they knew the scriptures. That's what they did. They were the pros. They were like religious lawyers. They knew every single detail. They used to beat people over the head with it. Not only did they kind of keep the law of Moses right to the letter, but they also, as we looked at the previous weeks, they expanded and expanded, creating new little details of what you can and can't do, over 1,500 plus of them, basically making people's lives a misery. But they certainly knew the law. And it's true, Leviticus 20, verse 10, Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, says that adultery carried the death sentence. But interestingly, it also says that both the man and the woman need to be brought out to be judged. If they were so obsessed with upholding the law, if they were so obsessed with, with the detail, where was the guy? Where was the guy? As was so often the case, they were not interested in honoring the law. They weren't really interested, of course, in honoring God, to be honest, but using the law for their own gain. Using the law for their own gain. And once again, Jesus sees through their hypocrisy. This was why they were always the target of Jesus' condemnation on them. He sees through their hypocrisy and does what he so often does, turns things completely on their head. What seemed like an impossible situation, Jesus, as we'll see, uses this to bring life and teaching, to expose hidden sin and forgive exposed sin. And he still does that today. The accusers become the accused. He turns things on their head. I mean, perhaps rather than knowing this story as the woman caught in the act of adultery, we should probably call it the scribes caught in the act of hypocrisy, because that's what it is. Jesus turns the whole focus around. And faced with this dilemma, he starts to, to just draw with his finger right in the, in the dust, in the sand. He doesn't say what he writes or why he writes. Maybe he's, he's just buying some thinking time. It's quite a good tactic, isn't it? Let me just think about it. You know, so often we, we just need to think before we speak sometimes. But commentators give lots of different suggestions. I mean, some link this to Deuteronomy 9, verse 10, where, where God hands Moses the Ten Commandments, and it says the law is written with the finger of God. Maybe there's Jesus there, God incarnate, God in the flesh, writing with his finger. Maybe he was writing out the, 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 the Ten Commandments. Who knows? Maybe he was pointing out, guys, just be careful here. Think about what you're doing. You're trying to trap the one who actually wrote the law. But a lot of commentators, and I think this probably is, is perhaps even more likely, they point to Jeremiah 17. And in verse 13 of Jeremiah 17, it says this, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. The spring of living water. And as we've just said the day before, there's Jesus standing up and saying, I'm the source, I'm the spring of living water. And here we now see the very ones rejecting the spring of living water. Maybe, perhaps, he was even writing that passage in the dust. Maybe he was even writing their names in the dust. Again, saying, think about what you're doing. You're rejecting the source of life, just like this writing in the dust. Be careful you don't get rubbed out, you don't get blown away. It's a deeply sobering thought, isn't it? 
But when they continue to press him for an answer, he stands up and says, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He shines the mirror straight back at their hearts. Our sin has always and always will be a heart issue. A heart issue. Interestingly, when we go back to Jeremiah 17 again, verse 9, it says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? goes on to talk about God examining our hearts. He sees what's in our hearts. This is what Jesus was doing with them. He saw their motivations. He saw their hearts. And he shone the mirror straight back at them. Maybe some of them at, his, his, at, at what he said, you know, let anyone who is without sin. Maybe his words from the Sermon of the Mount kind of were ringing in their ears. Where he said, whoever looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery in his heart. Maybe that just went, oh, hello. Shines the mirror back at their heart. Because again, as the Sermon of the Mount pointed out time and time again, you might be keeping the letter of the law, but you've lost the spirit of the law. You've lost its very heart. Do you not see? The issue is the heart. That's where you need your healing. That's where you need the forgiveness. That's where you need to change. And although Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, the heart is beyond cure, the truth is only Jesus can heal our hearts. Only Jesus can heal our hearts. But whatever he wrote, every single one of those accusers were convicted in their hearts. And one by one, fell away. Finally, Jesus could now turn his attention to this, to this poor woman lying there. As I said, shamed, terrified, awaiting her fate. Perhaps thinking, are you now going to throw a stone at me? Because the truth is, Jesus was the only one who was without sin. He could have picked up the stone and lobbed it. But instead of throwing a stone he chose to forgive. Rather than condemn, he forgave. As he said earlier to Nicodemus, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This is exactly what he's doing here. He's just fulfilling his mission. Not to condemn, but to save. And he turns to her and says, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. That is really important, that last bit. Because notice, he doesn't minimize or ignore the sin. Forgiveness doesn't just brush sin under the carpet and say it doesn't matter. It does the opposite. It actually says there's something here, there's an issue here that needs forgiveness that needs to be addressed. You know, he doesn't condemn her, but he also doesn't condone her sin. Sin is still sin, and it needs dealing with. But it's not through the law. It's not that the law was bad in itself. It just had absolutely no power to change what we all need to be changed. And again, that's our hearts. No one has ever been saved by keeping God's commandments because no one ever could. Only Jesus truly fulfilled the law. But what was the point of the law? It was to point us to Jesus. It was to point us to our need, our recognition that, yeah, only you can change my heart. I can't do it. Only you can change my heart. Not only that, but of course, the law in sinful hands became a weapon to, to, to condemn and to accuse and to beat people over their head with. It's what these religious leaders do. Romans 8 verse 3 says, The law was weakened by our fallen human nature. Rather than point people to Jesus, people used it as a weapon to kind of belittle others, to make ourselves feel good. And yet, ultimately, it points us or should point us to Jesus, the one who doesn't condemn, but actually comes, as we've been talking about this morning, 
to live inside us by his spirit. This is the promise of the new covenant. Again, that Jeremiah prophesied about years before. 33 verse 30, 31 verse 33. I will put my law, not on a tablet of stone, but in their minds and inscribe it on their hearts. This is an internal change. Again, his contemporary Ezekiel said, I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. So in one sense where it says the the human heart is deceitful and above cure, what's the cure? A new heart. A heart transplant. A complete change, a new spirit as we put our trust in Jesus and, and receive his free gift of forgiveness. Allow his Holy Spirit to do a work in our hearts so we are totally free from the condemnation of the law. And all the uncertainty and all the guilt that goes with that. It's the gospel of grace. Freely given. Freely, if the law was like this external judge condemning and accusing, grace is like this internal compass. Guiding, affirming, empowering. Total change when we receive the forgiveness of Jesus. Yes, forgiveness is a free gift. It doesn't mean it's cheap. It cost Jesus everything. It cost him his life. And the reason that Jesus could say to that woman right there, I forgive you, go and sin no more, was because six months later, he would be nailed to the cross, carrying the very thing she was accused of. Carrying her sin. Carrying my sin. Carrying your sin. She didn't realize it at the time, of course. But the reason she could walk away shame-free, guilt-free, forgiven, was because Jesus would claim that sin for himself. I'll take your shame. I'll take your sin. You walk free. Don't miss the, 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 the imagery here. This incredible picture of standing in between the accuser and us standing in between our judgment and us. Jesus stands right in between, taking it upon himself. And he still does that today. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never received his forgiveness, if you've never said, Jesus, I trust in your uh, sacrificial death on the cross. I know you died for my sin. I now trust in you. If you've never received that, Basically, you're saying, actually, I'll take the judgment on myself. Whereas Jesus is willingly offering, I will stand in the gap. Rather than throwing the first stone, he, in effect, took the first stone. And the next, and the next, and the next. He took the penalty of death upon himself, taking our shame and our guilt and our brokenness, and says over us, go, go and leave your life of sin. It's a powerful picture right here between the accusers and the broken woman. It's just a picture of what he does for us, what he's done for us on the cross. Perhaps this morning you feel like that woman, broken, condemned, shamed. You know, we can be our own worst critics, can't we, as well? We can condemn ourselves time and time again. I'm unworthy, I'm unworthy. But also the Bible says we have an accuser, Satan. In Revelation uh, chapter 12, I think it says he accuses us day and night before God. Day and night. And yet, for those who trust in Jesus' total forgiveness, this is what the Bible says over you. Romans 8, 33. Who dares accuse whom God has chosen for his own. No one. No one. For God himself has given us right standing before himself. If you accept Jesus' free gift of righteousness, his free gift of forgiveness, there is no one that can accuse you. His blood speaks a better word over you than any other claim over your life. You are free 
And please, if you are feeling shamed and under condemnation, and yet you, you know Jesus has died for you, you've, 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 seek to, you've sought to follow him, please hear these words over your life. Neither do I condemn you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. You are free. You are free. But another aspect of this that um, I find really, really challenging is how often am I just like those Pharisees and scribes? How often am I like them? Particularly in this digital age where it's really easy to to throw a stone because we can do it so anonymously, anon, sorry, if I can say it anonymously behind the keyboard, just lob a stone in there. You know, our culture loves to put people down, loves people to, sh- to shut people down, you know, because it makes us look better, feel better. It's a really ugly side of human nature. You only need to spend some time on Twitter or other social media platforms to, to see that in action. I've I just discovered this thing called ratioing. Have we heard of ratioing? It's this weird thing. I, maybe it's just new, but um, it's basically where the ratio of comments to likes are, are taken into account. So the more comments you have against likes basically means m- people disapprove of your post. So very few likes, but loads of comments because they're all negative. You know, and that's what people look at now. It's the comment to like ratio. So now what we get in comments is people simply writing ratioed, ratioed, ratioed to add to the comments to make the comments more than the likes. It's so petty. And then people disagree with someone ratioing. So they're going, I'm ratioing that ratio. And then someone becomes, well, I'm ratioing that ratio that's been ratioed. And it goes on and on and on. If you look at the comments on these things, it's like, what is going on? I had to Google it. All these ratio, I'm ratioing this ratio. And it's this, it's basically people stamping their disapproval on your post. Ratioed. It's toxic. It really is ugly, isn't it? And so petty. But it makes us feel good. I'm putting someone down. How quick we are to throw a stone. How quick we are to to point a finger. Don't think that we are immune from that. God, heal our hearts. Heal our hearts. You know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't stop at the church, of course. You know, the church is not exempt from this. Uh, there's been a recent podcast series looking at uh, the rise and fall of Mars Hill Church, particularly focusing on their, their pastor, their senior pastor, and just looking at issues and, and faults that, that were found there. And, and, you know, it was incredibly well put together, and at its heart was to learn lessons. You know, mistakes have been made. Let's make sure we don't make them again. Let's, let's learn. So in its heart, it was quite genuine. But what has shocked people is that it's become quite a phenomenon. It's, it's become hugely popular. People are waiting with bated breath for the next episode. And people are starting to, to comment their concern at the, the desire and the appetite, you know, almost this desire to get a fix on somebody else's failure. Again, it's revealing a bit of an ugly side in people's hearts, a dark side. You know, getting a little fix. Oh, I do like hearing about someone else's failure. Why? Well, it makes me feel better. At least I'm not like them. And we really need to do, we just need to do some mirror reflecting ourselves on our hearts. You know, when we see others fall or or fail or, or slip up, does that give us a slight boost? Are we tempted even to pull others down to make ourselves look better? That's straight out of the Pharisees' playbook. And it really doesn't model Jesus' heart here to redeem and to restore. So really, uh, you know, my prayer for myself, for all of us, is to make sure that rather than point the finger, our heart attitude is there but for the grace of God, go I. We're totally dependent on God's grace, on God to change our hearts. God, make my heart more like Jesus. Seeking to restore, seeking to redeem. Lord, when I see others slip up and fail, may I be grieved and not gloat. 
May I seek to, to help them up and restore them, to point them to Jesus, to the one who can heal their hearts. Let's earnestly seek to be like him because he alone can heal our hearts. I'm going to finish there. I'm going to invite the band back. But Jesus turned this whole situation completely on its head. The accusers became the convicted. The convicted received forgiveness. This, this place of shame and guilt became a place of grace. Jesus can do the same for you today. This death sentence became an invitation to a whole new life in Christ. You know, wouldn't it be amazing if some of those scribes, when Jesus convicted them, actually knelt down beside the woman and said, Jesus, I too, I too need your forgiveness. You know, he would have said the same thing over them. I don't condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Maybe some of them did later. Who knows? But listen, it's never too late for us to receive Christ's forgiveness. If you're here this morning, or if you're catching up online later, can I just invite you, receive Jesus' free gift of righteousness. Allow him to take that penalty for your sin. Allow him to give you the wonderful forgiveness that only he can give. Allow him to transform your heart, a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. And again, if you're someone who's, who is a follower of Jesus but struggles with shame and guilt, again, just hear those words over you. Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. And Lord, I just pray for all of us who where we're tempted just to throw a, an odd stone, to gloat a little bit. Lord, help us to change our hearts. Holy Spirit, help us to be those that grieve when people fall and seek to raise people up, Lord. We're one body, Lord, and when one part suffers, we all feel it. Lord, help us to be united in you, to be united in that one heart and one spirit, to see you glorified. Lord, let this stamp of your love radiate through all that we do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him, shall we?